Yo, what's up, friends and fam? Great to see you today. Thanks for crashing a party. For everybody watching us online, great to have you here. Hey, if you are watching in any of the areas that were affected by the storm uh, this weekend, I know we have people watching from Orlando, from Pompano Beach, from Tampa, from Charleston, from Myrtle Beach. Big shout out to you guys. Uh, if there's any way we can help or serve you, be sure to let us know. You can shoot us an email at info at Discover Revo or prayer at Discover Revo. Uh, we want to help you where you are. Uh, and if there's anybody in the room and you're, you're interested in partnering, we have uh, partner churches in all of those cities that are on the ground now. Uh, so instead of just giving to a generic like nonprofit, hey, let's put resources in the hands of churches that are in the most affected areas. We work with a lot of churches and organizations in those areas. And so, I uh, mean, if that's you, if you're interested in that, be sure to indicate that on the next step card. Uh, swing by guest services on the way out, the connection bar, and we'd love to get you connected on that. So glad, hope that you all stayed safe. Everything was going well uh, for you this weekend and uh, that, that you did well. I got to tell you about something that when I first heard about it, I did not believe it. I had to research it myself. I said, there's no possible way this could be real. Like, don't tell me we are at this point in our life <laughs> right now that this is a real thing. But uh, recently I heard about a, a service online where if you don't have a friend, you can rent one. And the name of the website, I checked it out. I had to go look at it, see for yourself. The name of the website is rentafriend.com. Real easy to remember. According to rentafriend.com, they are the number one biggest website that lets you rent a friend. There you go, creative ways right there. I even looked on the homepage. They said, let, let me tell you the, the top two reasons why someone would go online and rent a friend. They have hundreds of thousands of people on their website available to rent. Seems sort of like human trafficking, but it's, they say it's legit. Um, the, the two most common uh, occasions where someone would go on their website and rent a friend is a, 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 a wedding date and a prom date. So anybody got a wedding invitation and you got a plus one, you don't want to show up alone. What does that say about you? So you want to have somebody, and not just somebody like your cousin, I'm talking about somebody that looks good, right? Somebody that's attractive, that's rich or famous. You can find these people on rentafriend.com. Don't you want to impress everyone that is at the wedding? Uh, th they give you this long list of different ways, like, have you ever thought about this in order to, to rent a friend? The first one is, do you want to show off? Perhaps you have a business party coming up and you want to show off to all your coworkers that you have great tastes in men or women. So you can rent this friend to come up that's like the most interesting man in the world or the best looking person in the world or, or whatever. You can rent them, like show up and, and show off. Here's something for those of you that, that are already, if you're single in the room and you're already not looking forward to going home where your parents are going to ask you, so you got anybody special? So you dating anyone? Like so, so you're by yourself, like are you going to be by yourself the rest of your life? Like, like, I know, I got single friends that are like, everybody's always asking me, why, why aren't you married? You can go to rentafriend.com and they will travel home with you over Christmas. And they will sit at your family table and pretend to be your girlfriend or your boyfriend. And that way you can get your parents off your back and let them know, hey, I am actively looking. And as you can see, I have incredibly great tastes in men and women. Rent, rent a friend for that if you're going home for the holidays. Uh, another one, is there someone at work that's annoying you? Well, you can actually rent a friend to show up at your office, ladies, with a big bouquet of flowers. And he'll walk in and say, I love you. I was just thinking about you today. I just wanted to bring you these. I got to go. Like, you can just rent them for 10 minutes. Just rent a buddy for 10 minutes so that all the other guys in the office will know, hey, stop, stop flirting at me. You guys are super thirsty right now. Just like back down. Like I have someone, you just met them and they brought flowers to me. That, like you can, you can rent someone uh, for, for that occasion. My favorite though, like you can make some money off this right here. If you are moving, you can rent a friend to come and help you pack up your boxes. I thought we called those movers, but undoubtedly rent a friend calls them 
rental friends, uh, but they will help you back, box up your house and move all of your stuff to your new house. If you are a fan of tennis, did you know that you can't play tennis by yourself? You know that if you're a tennis player. Uh, you can rent someone to meet you at the park and play tennis with you. And if you pay extra, they will let you win. So you can build your self-confidence, right? Isn't this amazing? Like this is a, this is a business. And, and when I came across the text that we're going to look at in the book of Judges today in Samson's story, I had no idea that this Sunday sermon was going to be brought to you by rentafriend.com. It's amazing that these odd verses are tucked away in the story of Samson. I don't know if you've ever heard them or read them before, but, but I want to I pull them out. Tell me if, if you see anything weird about this. Tell me if anything that I say in these verses kind of like, piques your interest and say, hey, wait, stop right there. Let's, 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 let's look at that. In, in Judges 14, today is Samson's wedding. And uh, Samson is getting ready to marry a Philistine who is a, a woman that does not love God, that is the enemy of God's people. Samson's parents tried to tell him, don't date this girl. You're going to end up lo- falling in love with her and marrying her. Don't. This is going to wreck your life. Did Samson listen? No, he did not. And so, alas, here we are on his wedding day. Judges chapter 14, verse 10 says this. Then Samson's father accompanied him to Timnah for the marriage. Samson hosted a party there, for this was customary for bridegrooms to do. Verse 11, when the Philistines saw he had no attendants, they gave him 30 groomsmen who kept him company. Does anybody else find anything peculiar about that? Samson didn't even have any friends to show up at his own wedding. He showed up, and and the Bible says that the only person that came with him was his dad. I mean, can you imagine how embarrassing that would be? Most churches, when they do a wedding, they split the room in half. Bride's family and friends over here. Groom's family and friends over here. At Samson's wedding, this woman had her whole section filled. There was one chair taken in Samson's section, and it was his dad. And it's his dad, like his dad had to go to the wedding, right? No friends. Didn't have any buddies to celebrate. Maybe the most happiest day of Samson's life. And he had no one to celebrate with. No one to say, hey, like, come and stand beside me on stage. The Bible says that when the Philistines saw that, you know, his bride had like 25, 30 grooms, no, not grooms, brides, women's, bridesmaids, all right, all right, slow down. They were like, well, this guy doesn't have anything. So they just picked 30 people. So, hey, Samson, I want to introduce you to your best man. His name is John. Well, welcome, John. Thanks for being my best man. And on down the line. And he had no idea who any of them were. Can you imagine that? Like, can you imagine looking back? 20 years later on your wedding album and, and like your kids are like, who is that, dad? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> have no idea who any of those guys are. They just showed up that day and were a part of it. And Samson had no meaningful relationships in his life. You can read throughout the three, three chapters in the book of Judges, he's always by himself. Uh, you see him frequently with his parents, uh, but you know, I mean, that's his parents. Like he didn't have a choice. Like they were going to roll together their family. You can't get rid of them. But the odd thing about it, anytime he was around his parents, he never listened to them. He, he, he never took their advice. He did the opposite of everything that his mom and dad told him to do. It was just like, give the stiff arm, like, y- you guys be quiet. I'm going to run my own race here. I'm doing my own thing. So they might as well not even have been there. Uh, Samson had three gals in his life, three different girls that he had so-called relationships with. But when you read the story, he really didn't have a relationship with them at all because everything about these women for Samson was all about lust. It was just they were good to look at. It was arm candy for him. He saw girls that were extremely attractive, and he says, I want you to be a part of my life. It was all about that. He didn't know them. He didn't have a relationship or a friendship with them. Samson lived his entire life in total isolation, so much so to the point at his own wedding, not only did he not have a single guest that showed up, but he didn't even have any groomsmen to stand by him on what should have been a celebratory happy day. See, Samson did not grasp the fact that we are not made to live in isolation. That God actually created us to live in community, to have meaningful friendships in in our lives. A lot of people are are living in isolation today. And it doesn't take you very long to read the Bible to realize that you and I were not made to live alone. We were better together. You can actually go back to the first page of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 2, 
God is creating the whole world, right? And it's seven days in order. And at the end of every day, he's like, and it is good. He created the, the sun and the moon and the stars, and it is good. And he created the, the waters and the land, and it is good. And he created the plants and the animals, it is good. It wasn't until the sixth day that God created man that God looked down for the very first time in the history of humanity. And God looked at what he had created, and he said, this is not good. This right here, not good. In, in Genesis chapter 2, second chapter of the Bible, probably on the first page of your Bible, it reads this. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Not good for Adam to be isolated, to not have any friendships and relationships. I will make a helper who is just right for him. God is making a huge statement here, a radical statement here. I want you to think about it. Who was with Adam in the garden at this point? God. It was Adam and God. God walked in the garden with Adam, side by side. Not proverbial walked, not footprints in the sand, and then there was only one, and it was you carrying me. No, no, no. God was walking beside Adam in the flesh, and God looked at that and said, this is not good. Not good. It's interesting. One of the things I learned post-COVID is I, as I try to connect with people that uh, are, are honestly, they're Christians, but they're, they're no longer involved in a church. They no longer attend. Um, maybe they, they uh, sit at home. And a, a lot of them that I, that I interact with, uh, you know, have the same response, the same story. Well, well my, my relationship with God is very private and it's very personal. And uh, like all I need, here's the phrase, uh, God is all I need. I don't need a church. I don't need friends. I don't need the gathering. I don't need to show up anywhere. I can wake up and pray and listen to worship music and read my Bible and spend time with God alone. God is all I need. And what's so interesting about that is that is the exact opposite of what God says. (laughs) Now, if you're talking about your salvation, then that's absolutely right. God is all you need. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ the Son. God did all of the work by sending Jesus to the world to die for our sins so that our relationship could be reconciled with him. Bottom line, you don't need anything else for your salvation. But your life here on earth, even God looked at it and said, it is not enough for it to be just you and me. There has to be more. You were made for more. You were made for community. And so when I, when I hear people say that, they're like, you know, I'm just reading my Bible at home and, and I don't need the church, I don't, I don't need people. I'm like, when you say reading your Bible, did you get past the first page? Because on the first page, it says you need people. You were created for relationships. You were created for community. It's not good enough for God and man to walk alone. There has to be more. So God outlines that, throws that all together and looks and says this is not good for, for man to be alone. Uh, did you know that even being alone can hinder your prayers? Like some of you that are isolated, that, that don't have meaningful relationships, uh, did you know that God tries to answer your prayers, but if you don't surround yourself with people, then many of your prayers will never be answered. Because if you think about it, oftentimes the answers to our prayers what God does is he sends people into our lives. If you are praying because you're discouraged, what is God gonna do? Like God's not gonna waltz up into your bedroom and be like, hey, me and you, right? I'll encourage you. No, God's gonna send somebody, a person, someone else. Man, if you're looking for ways for your life to move forward, you wanna be encouraged or challenged or, or man, God, I'm lonely or I'm lost. I don't know what to do. I wish I had some help. God is going to send people to you. Like people is, 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 is one of the means that God uses to answer your prayer. So if you've isolated yourself, then God might be trying desperately to answer your prayers, but you have shut him off because he works through people. It's amazing how dangerous isolation is. And Samson was understanding that for, for the first time in, in his life. Oftentimes, God will use others to speak to us and to encourage us. So here's what God does. God fixes the problem right here. He looks and he says, Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. And so he uses two words. He says, I'm going to send you a helper that will be suitable for you. A helper that will be suitable for you. That Hebrew word for helper means a rescuer. It means someone that is going to give you strength. Now, this is interesting because this is a word that God only uses for himself in the Old Testament. 
all the times that God saved and rescued his people. Think about when Moses and the Israelites got to the Red Sea and the the Pharaoh was behind him and the Red Sea was in front of him. Scripture says that God, the Azar, that's the Hebrew word for helper, showed up and parted the Red Sea. But in this one instance, God gives Eve the same title that he has reserved for himself. This gal right here, Adam, is going to be your helper. She's going to give you strength when you need it. God gave Eve to Adam to give him things that he didn't have on his own. And interestingly enough, Adam would be Eve's helper as well. And so God builds it all together. Helpers are the ones that give you strength. They're the ones that encourage you. They're the ones that build you up. They're there to support you. But God says also, you don't need just a helper. You need someone that is suitable for you. Now, that, now, the word suitable is an interesting Hebrew word. It means one that stands in opposition to you. But it doesn't mean an enemy. It means someone that's going to stand in front of you and is willing to ask the tough questions. The person in your life that's willing to, to look back and say, all right, now look, Adam, I know that's a great idea, but we need to slow down, okay? We need to think through these things. We need to process this information together. These are the people that ask you the hard questions, that challenge you, that, that just aren't just always uh, rainbows and unicorns, and every day is a great day, and you're great, and you're the best, and you can do it and live your best life now. Like, no, these are the people that's like, hey, what you're doing right now is dumb. You need to rethink that. You haven't thought through that. You're getting ready to wreck your life. You're getting ready to make a mistake. See, God had both of those people. Do you have those people in your life? Like, do you have encouragers? I do. Have people that are, that are cheerleaders for you, but also do you have people that are willing to stop and say, hey, man, like, pause, hold, hold on a second. I got a buddy of mine, Rob Wetzel. He's a guy that'll, that'll stop me when I have a big idea and he'll say, hey, we need to think through this, all right? No, wait a minute, let's think about the details. Let's talk about it together. You need guys like that that are suitable for you to do life and to do ministry with. Love that guy, appreciate him so much. Are you an encourager to others? Are you a, a helper? Are you suitable for others, one that would challenge, and as Proverbs 27 says, that iron sharpens iron. Are we pushing each other in that direction? That's what God said Adam needed. That's what good friendships are. That's what it means to be connected in that way. So I wish that we could look at the story of Samson, and I could preach from his story and say, let me give you four great ways that, that, that what biblical friendships and biblical community is so important as opposed to isolation. Unfortunately, I can't. We're going to have to go outside of the story of Samson to learn about the dangers of isolation and the importance of having true meaningful relationships and friendships in your life. And so I want to go and spend the rest of the time, next few minutes with you guys in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes was written by the uh, King Solomon. Uh, King Solomon wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Uh, so he's a, the wisest man. The Bible says he was the wisest man that ever lived. A really powerful, wealthy king. And he wrote these books to his younger sons who would one day be kings. And in Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 4 verse 9, Solomon begins to speak to his sons about the importance of having the right people in your life. The dangers of isolation, and really uh, Solomon's going to give us four reasons why community is better than isolation. Samson never got this, and it wrecked his life. And I want us to get this and understand these four ways, just in four verses, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. Here's the first verse. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Two people are better off than one because they can help each other succeed. Here's the first thing I want you to jot down. If you have your notes, pull them out. If you have your app, all the notes will be there. Um, benefits of community over isolation is this. When you're in community, number one, you are more successful. You experience more success when you have other people in your lives, I would argue, in all areas than you would if you were isolated. You know, medically speaking, they've done uh, studies on people that have deep friendships versus people that live in isolation. You know what they found? All of these categories, people that live in community and have deep relationships have a stronger immune system. Maybe that's because you're shaking hands and hugging and you're swiping germs and all that. But anyway, you don't get sick as much. You have a stronger immune system when you have friends in your life. You have lower stress levels 
in your life when you have friends. And some of you have relationships, you're like, not my friends, right? You hang out with the people I do and it goes up. Now, statistically speaking, people that are isolated, don't have meaningful relationships, have a higher level of stress. Physically, they are not as successful as those of us that have meaningful and deep relationships. Science tells us that people that have solid relationships are less likely to struggle with mental health issues. Less likely to have things like anxiety and depression in your life when you have some meaningful relationships. I, I remember sharing this uh, with, with you all last year, but uh, in, in 2021, uh, early last year, uh, Gallup put a poll out uh, where they, they polled over a thousand people and they asked them, one of the questions they asked them is they wanted to know the effect that COVID had on people's mental health. And so one of the questions that they asked uh, was like, fill in the blank, over the past 18 months, has your mental health improved? stayed the same or gotten worse and out of the thousand over thousand people that they polled they broke them down into like 27 different demographics did you know that there was only one single demographic that marked that their mental health improved over the 18 months of COVID only one section of the demographic you know what section it was people that said they attended weekly church at least once a week People that said, even in the midst of, of a shelter in place and completely isolate yourselves from everyone, I'm going to surround myself with a group of people once a week in church and worship together. And so science is telling us all this. We've got all these new studies about how the benefits of community and, and the medical field is saying, well, we've got all these benefits of the, the community. And Christians are like, welcome to the party. <laughs> we knew that like 2,000 years ago. You should have asked. Better late than never, Mr. Scientist. Great. Because the Bible teaches us that's how God created us. We're better together. We're not made to be alone. We'll be more successful when we're together. This happens in the business field as well. Uh, more people around the table. We have these phrases like two heads are better than one, right? We're going to be more successful. If I can get another head in the room to help me think through it, then I'll be smarter with someone else and, and, and not just not just me. Here's another phrase. Teamwork makes the dream work. It's the idea that if we can get some people that are working together on a team, like we'll be more successful. We'll make more income. I mean, think about it. If you want to grow your business or business starts growing and you want to expand and get even bigger, what do you do? You have to bring more people on because you can't be more successful alone. You can't reach a certain level by yourself. And so the Bible teaches that spiritually it's the same way. We need people to help us in our relationship with God, to move forward, to take these next steps. Samson had no one in his life like that. And spiritually this guy was a wreck, isolated, had no one else. One of the dangers of isolation is a reduced amount of success in your life in all areas. I mean, we're reading it here in, in business, in health, in finances, spiritual, emotional, and mental health. Like all different aspects of this, you'll be better together, better than you would be alone. In, in verse 10, we see it. So not only are you more successful in community, but in verse 10, he continues. He says, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. One of the other benefits of being in community and having friendships is this, you have more help in your life. You have more success in your life, statistically proven. Number two, you have more help. See, help provides stability. People provide stability in your life. When things go wrong, when you fall, who's gonna be there to pick you up? The Bible says, you wanna know somebody that I feel sorry for? Somebody that falls and has no one there to help them. No one there to pick them up. Um, you got to remember the, the context of what Ecclesiastes and King Solomon was writing. We're talking about Jerusalem thousands of years ago. There were no sidewalks. There were no roads. There were rocks everywhere, really treacherous terrain. In fact, you can go to Jerusalem today, to the Holy Land, visit some of these sites, and it's incredibly hard to get to most of them. I mean, there's boulders and like everywhere is rocky and hilly. Like if you're not in good shape, then like you're just going to struggle the whole way as you're touring the Holy Land. And that's the context that, that Solomon was writing to. He's like, man, people wouldn't even travel alone in, in, in thousands of years ago in Jerusalem. Because what happens if you're, you, know, you got your backpack or you're pulling your donkey with your cart and it gets stuck? You got no one to help you. 
What happens if it tips over? You got no one to help you. If you don't have anybody there, then you are stuck. I mean, we actually have a whole business in today's world of helping people that are by themselves when they fall. Like it's, it's a life alert. You can wear a little necklace around your, your neck. And if, if you're a, a person that lives by themselves, like one of the fears is what happens if they fall and they can't reach the phone? They could lay there for days. They could die if they break something and they can't get up. And so life alerts, like you can pay us hundreds of dollars a year and you can hit this button. If you've fallen and you can't get up, we will come get you. And so there's a business here that makes millions of dollars a year based on something the Bible talked about thousands of years ago. Because the person that falls when they are alone is in deep trouble. See, we fall all the time. Not just physically, we can fall mentally, emotionally, spiritually, morally. And when you fall, do you have anybody in your life that will help you pick you up? Because if you're isolated, the answer is no. And who knows what kind of pain and trauma and frustration you're going to have when you look around at the moment where you fell down and there's no one around to help pick you up. Not only is it more successful, but it offers, it offers more help for, for people. Um, this, uh, this week, a buddy of mine lives in Virginia. He called me, and uh, he's a pastor there in Virginia about three or four hours away. And he had a, a friend of his that was coming to Baptist Hospital because they were going to donate a kidney. He's going to be a live donor and uh, so he called me. He said, hey, man, Nathan, I'm, I'm four hours away. I'm not going to be able to make it, but I have a friend. His name's Ben. He just had surgery at Baptist. I know you live in Winston. Would you be willing to go over there and visit him? It's like, of course. Of course I do. So I go up there to, over to uh, Baptist Hospital. And because I'm a pastor and also I work with the fire department, like I have all of the badges. I can get anywhere in the hospital I want to. I can check your records if you're in there. So like, just call me. I can swipe it and get in. So I walk into this guy's room. Ben, never met the guy before. Got my mask on, you know, they're still doing masking in the hospital. I'm like, Ben, what's up, man? He's never seen me before. He sees all the, the things. He thinks I'm a doctor. He's like, hey. I was like, yep, my name is Dr. Klein. That's actually not a lie. And so, um, I was just, so I just decided I'd milk it, right? I was like, so Ben, here's what I'm going to need you to do, man. I need you to turn over on your side and pull your pants down. I need to do a, do a check real quick. <laughs> and uh, I was like, hi, just kidding. And he, he was nervously laughing, just like you were. And uh, <laughs> I was like, hi, man, don't worry about it. I'm a pastor. I, I'm a buddy of, of your pastor. His name's David. And, and David called me and said you were here and you had this surgery and there was, he couldn't be here and there's nobody else here and you just donated a kidney. Like, I want to hear the story. Tell me about it. But he was laying flat on his back in a hospital room in a city that he'd never been on. But because he had a relationship that knew someone else, uh, a doctor named Dr. Klein walked in <laughs> that he'd never met before. And I got to hear his story and I got to pray with him. Powerful story. And incredibly he's texted me a few times and he's like man that was so encouraging man you you need somebody hey if something happens to you and you're on your back in the hospital do you have anybody to call do you have anybody that'll reach out to you that'll love you that'll visit you that'll crack jokes with you encourage you and lift you up like that man bible says i feel for the person that falls and there's no one there to help them you need, you need more help in your life than you think, and that's what good community brings us. Verse 11, uh, he continues, he said, Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be kept warm alone? Single guys, if you're dating, don't pull this verse out on your girl. Don't pull that. Don't be like, well, the Bible says if we'll snuggle, we'll be warmer. Okay, stop, <laughs> stop. Let me tell you the context behind this. Number three, uh, we need more strength. If you have community, verse 11 says, when you have people around you, it gives you more, more strength. It gives you intimacy. Uh, so let me give you a little, little, little tidbit here. Um, back in the day when this was written, uh, there were no hotels. All of the inns were no holiday and they were no comfort, okay? Uh, they were open air inns. In fact, they had no beds in them, no bathrooms. It was just basically an open air with a roof over it that if you wanted to spend the night, then you could just shimmy up underneath the roof. But they didn't give you little sample, little small travel fun size soaps and shampoos. And they didn't have a bed with a, with a pullout in the, in the closet and extra linens up top. No, you had to bring all that with you. So if you had to travel, you literally had to bring your sheets and your covers and your blankets. And anything you would need on the road, you had to pack in your suitcase. And so the idea of traveling as a group, this was common case for, for people in the first century. People very rarely traveled alone because here was the deal. If you traveled by yourself, 
you had to carry everything you would need for the whole trip. And the Bible says, this is interesting, the Bible says that when you travel with a group, when you have other people with you that can keep you warm, because here's what they would do when they would spend the night, they would just, people just line up on the floor, like big spoon, little spoon, big spoon, little spoon, right here on the floor, and that's how they would stay warm at night. It was body heat. But if you didn't have that, then you'd have to pack your sheets and your clothes. Listen, if you don't have people in your life, it increased the amount of burden that you had to carry, literally. Like literally, you would have an extra bag that you were carrying on your trip if you weren't traveling with other people. Because if you didn't have an extra bag filled with blankets and pillows and sheets, then you would freeze at night because you were by yourself. Some of you are carrying an enormous burden right now in your life. And it feels like it's just heavy on you. And it feels like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And maybe one of the reasons why you feel that way is because you don't have friendships in your life that can help you identify that and say, let me help you with it. Hey, you don't need to carry that. When I'm here, we can do it together. And see, we we reduce the weight that we carry if we have relationships in our life that can help us do that. It's amazing. And so the little fun analogy is you don't want to have to pack all your own, your blankets and your comforters and your, your, your throws, do you? No, of course not. So just travel with people. It'll lighten your load. It'll make your life less heavy for you to, to carry. You need people like that in your life. Somebody that can look at the dashboard of your life and, and say, hey, here's a blinking light right here and, and I see it and I want to help you with it. I want to help take that burden off of you. I want to provide some strength. I want to provide some protection and some strength for you in your life in that area. That's what verse 11 tells us. The last one in verse 12, the fourth benefit of community and friendship over isolation is this. He says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Uh, having these meaningful relationships, something that Samson did not have and it cost him, will bring you this fourth thing. It brings you more protection. More protection in, in your life. Uh, see, again, people very rarely traveled alone in this time. It was very dangerous. Uh, one of Jesus' most famous stories that he tells in the Gospels actually illustrates this. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus says there was a man who was traveling on the roads alone. And what happened? He got jumped. He got beat up, he got mugged. Scripture says that he was like beaten within an inch of his life and they left him on the side of the road. Like that was commonplace. There were thieves and and, and people around the roads, around every corner waiting to pick off one person, waiting to find one person. Like talk to somebody today and and like if they're trying to to like harass somebody in a parking lot, you don't wanna walk in a parking lot by yourself. I don't let my wife go to Walmart by herself in the parking lot. Like I'm gonna go with her. That way we got each other's back, right? And I'm, I'm probably having to do most of the watching. If Elizabeth had my back, we'd probably be running. But the, the point is, you need each other's backs. And what happens when you're alone, you're easy prey. But when you're walking in a big group, somebody that wants to do you harm, they're going to be like, no, nah, I don't want to mess with 12 people. <laughs> like I'll wait for, for like one single person that's by themselves that I can sneak up from behind and grab. Did you know that you have an enemy? The Bible says that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking and looking for those that he can kill, steal from, devour, and destroy. And if you're walking around this life by yourself, there's nobody watching your back. Now, we use that word proverbially. We're like, hey, man, I got your back. But Scripture says there's sometimes, man, in areas of your life where you need someone, literally, you're fighting back to back so nothing can sneak up behind you. And maybe there's areas where you've had some pain and heartache in your life in the past because, man, you, have you ever heard people say that? Man, something happened in my life and it just came out of nowhere. Like, no, I didn't see it coming and it just knocked me down. Well, they might not have had anybody watching their back. They might have been living in isolation where a friend might have stepped in and said, hey, you need, to, you need to slow down, you need to calm down, you need to check this area, here's a blind spot, make sure you're not neglecting this. I don't want the enemy to get a foothold in your life. You need people like that. It provides more f- protection for, for us. My dad actually preached this message for Elizabeth and I's funeral. Or not funeral, wow, wedding. <laughs> no, it was a great day, babe. It was the best day of my life. <laughs> Oh, man, good times. 
My dad preached this for our wedding, a beautiful, wonderful, stupendous day, best day of my life. And uh, he landed on this last phrase. And he said, you know, Nathan, you and Elizabeth are gonna be good together. Two chords together are really good. But the Bible says that a chord of three strands is not easily broken. He said, Nathan, your life is gonna be so much better now that Elizabeth's in it. Now that you're making a family together and, and joining together a husband and wife. But he said, but if you want it to really be great, there's a third strand that you need. If you really want your life to be strong, you and your new wife need to why you need to braid, intertwine your lives together with the third strand, and that third strand is God. Yeah, God didn't look at Adam and say, it's, it's bad that you would be alone. But when Eve came on the show, it was not just Adam and Eve, it was Adam and Eve and God. It was a cord of three strands. I know sometimes at weddings, we like to say we're tying the knot, right? There's, there's two strings. There's a husband and the wife and you're tying the knot. I, I, I think Ecclesiastes says, no, we're, we're not tying the knot, we're braiding the rope because it's the bride and the groom and it's Jesus. If you wanna have a great marriage, you wanna have a great life, it's gonna take three strands in order to do that. And so I wanna challenge you today, like, are you living in isolation? Do, do you just walk in every Sunday morning and like two minutes before the service starts, you walk in and then as soon as the service is over, you walk out. Maybe your next step is just to linger a little bit. Just meet some people in the room. Maybe that's where you build relationships. Maybe it's to join a team. Uh, we got Rusty and his wife here. They just had a, a brand new baby. And, and I got an email from John back in the back. He runs the production back in the back. And, and he said, hey, we're gonna buy diapers for Rusty, right? Because he just had this brand new baby. And he sent that email out to the production team and the band. And so we're just bringing diapers, like baby shower. If you had a baby, is there anybody there that's gonna celebrate with you? Anybody there gonna throw boxes of diapers at you? Anybody gonna hook you up? We've had people that had surgeries and it's not long before their small group steps in and says, we're gonna provide meals for the next three weeks. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. We'll make sure it's there. The food's there. That needs to be the last thing that you're worried about. Are you involved in a small group? because that's where you're gonna build real friendships and relationships, being a part of service teams and, and small groups. Maybe it's even just lingering for a few minutes after the service to introduce yourself to some people. Maybe that's who God has sent to you to be an answer to your prayer this morning. God, I'm searching, I'm hurting, I'm lonely. God, I want answers. God, I need some peace. God, I, I'd love to feel like I belong somewhere. I'd love to have someone to talk to, someone to throw ideas off of. And God says, I wanna answer your prayer this morning. And the person is in this room right now. I don't know what your next step is, but I want you to take it. I want you to learn from Samson that we are not called to live in isolation, but in real, meaningful, deep relationships, not just with God, but with others. It'll make your life so much better. Let me pray for you. God, thanks for the example of Samson. What should have been the happiest day of his life he was standing alone, isolated. Even his enemies pitied him. God, I pray that that would not be our story. I pray that we would understand how you've created us to be in fellowship, in community, in relationship with others, that they make us better, they make us stronger, they make us more successful, they protect us. So many different characteristics and attributes that are positive that you saw from the very creation of man. So God, right now, give us the wisdom to know what to do with the words that we have just heard and the boldness to take the next steps so that we can experience real, true, full life the way that you designed it. Pray that and ask it in your son Jesus' name.